Good afternoon. Thank you for attending Tufts Children's Hospital's multidisciplinary webinar titled An Epidemic in the Pandemic, the Impact on the Mental Health of Children. I would like to thank the Boston Globe for the opportunity to shed some light on an issue that my colleagues and I hold very near and dear to our hearts. My name is Mary Margaret Quinn. I have been a nurse at Tufts Children's Hospital for a little over a year. Previously, I was assisting in a COVID ICU where I saw an immense amount of human suffering. However, this pediatric mental health epidemic is unlike anything I have ever experienced in my nursing career. At the start of the pandemic, I remember hearing the phrase, the good news is children. Um, at the start of the pandemic, I remember hearing the phrase, the good news is children are not getting as sick. Yet in asking them to help us stop the spread of COVID-19, we have also robbed them of a year of their childhood. Our children are our future and they are suffering. We as society owe it to them to invest in their future. We need support to combat this crisis. Children as young as seven are coming into our hospitals in such deep states of despair. The Pediatric Medical Surgical Unit at Tufts Children's Hospital is a 25 bed unit. And on any given day, up to a third of our floor census can be children and adolescents suffering from an acute mental health crisis among complex medical and surgical patients. This increase in this patient population has forced a shift in our clinical practice. As always, our goal as clinicians is to keep our children safe, but sometimes this is not enough. We need the state of Massachusetts to open more facilities that are better equipped to not only take these patients in, but help them in the midst of their crises. This issue is not going away. Just over the weekend, we admitted three additional children experiencing an acute mental health crisis. who started the long process of waiting for an inpatient mental health placement. Throughout this presentation, you will hear from several multidisciplinary experts who will walk you through their roles and experiences in taking care of these children. We need help and we need our society to prioritize mental health. I know I speak on behalf of my colleagues when I say we join this field in order to make a difference. But in the setting of this pediatric mental health crisis, more often than not, we leave work feeling helpless and frustrated. The goal of the following presentation is to highlight some of the preliminary data showing just how significant this crisis is, discuss some of the changes to our multidisciplinary practice, shed some light on the suffering that our children are experiencing, illustrate what an admission for a child or adolescent experiencing a mental health crisis may look like, and outline some of the specific interventions to combat this influx in this patient population, to, specific to Tufts Children's Hospital. We will share personal experiences from our time caring from the, for this patient population. Part of being a pediatric nurse is also supporting the family. I always remind my families that they are not alone in this. There are many other families going through a similar experience. We need to remove the stigma that is associated with talking about mental health. I am grateful to work alongside this panel of experts every day, and it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's presentation, Dr. Nina Dadles, Associate Chief Medical Officer for Quality at Tufts and a pediatric hospitalist at Tufts Children's Hospital. Thank you, Mary Margaret. We are excited to have the opportunity to speak with you today about a true crisis for teenagers across the country the significant increase in mental health concerns in youth during the COVID-19 pandemic. We've brought together a multidisciplinary group of experts from Tufts Children's Hospital that have been working with our children and teenagers admitted to the hospital for mental health concerns. Before I introduce you to the panel, I wanted to welcome all of our attendees and encourage you to use the Q&A tool at the bottom to ask questions live during the event. Some questions will be taken during the presentation and we'll also leave time to address questions at the end. We also thank all of you that have pre-submitted questions and we will try to address those as best we can both during the presentation and during that Q&A Q session at the end. Uh, we wanted to also highlight that the virtual event will be recorded and will be distributed to all attendees post-event. It is now my pleasure to introduce my colleagues from Tufts Children's Hospital who will serve as our panelists today. First, Mary Margaret Quinn, who you just met, is a staff nurse in our pediatric inpatient medical unit at Tufts Children's Hospital. 
Allison Butler is a certified child life specialist at Tufts Children's Hospital. Dr. Irene Ahmed is a child and adolescent psychiatrist that works both in the outpatient setting and as a consultant on the inpatient service for children and teenagers with mental health concerns. Melissa Coombs is a nurse leader on our inpatient pediatric medical unit. And Nikki Beatrice is a psychiatric occupational therapist who works on the adult inpatient psychiatry unit at Tufts Medical Center and has now joined our team as well on the pediatric medical inpatient unit at Tufts Children's Hospital to support this patient population. As our title and epidemic within the pandemic alludes to, our story today is inextricably linked to the events of the last year and a half. Here you see depicted some of the key dates that had huge impacts on children and families in Massachusetts. On February 1st, 2020, we had the first COVID-19 case in Massachusetts that was followed by a series of closures in March. Boston Mayor Marty Walsh was the first to announce school closures in the Boston Public Schools. Several days later, Governor Baker announced that all public and private schools would close through April 7th. Subsequently, the stay-at-home order was issued and non-essential businesses were closed, restaurants were closed, and this was the start of families being confined to their homes. This also signaled the start of financial difficulties for some families who no longer had stable income. We saw stress on the entire family unit. Everyone was hopeful that this would all be temporary, but as we know, April 21st, Governor Baker then announced that schools would remain closed for the remainder of the academic year. May 1st, we saw the, the start of universal masking in public um, and a, a change of how we interacted with others. And in August of 2020, schools were then required to submit plans for the new school year. Many chose full remote or hybrid options further isolating children and teenagers from their peers. Here you see just a snapshot of the many news articles that came out highlighting the impact on teenagers. The kids are not okay loneliness, anxiety, and loss, and also a surge in child abuse as more families were in crisis. We'll now have the opportunity to hear some stories of teenagers that were affected by the pandemic. I would think it was boring because you can't really go anywhere because everything is locked down or is restricted to certain things. You couldn't really like see friends or do anything that was fun. So kind of just had to stay inside all day. Oh, the one word I think of to describe this year would probably be like tiring. Even though you barely do anything, it's tiring. One thing that helped me was definitely talking to people and going to therapy. And I feel like that's not acknowledged enough because therapy is very important. And it's always good to talk to somebody. I have a lot of social anxiety and I have had depression in the past. And I feel like talking to somebody definitely helps with that. You can, you know, learn and process the root of your anxiety or your bad feelings, and it just helps you acknowledge them better and learn how to not exactly get rid of them, but how to deal with them and coexist in a way. I don't know how to, <laughs> I don't know a better way to describe it, but talking definitely does help and it's very important. I think everybody should do it. So really powerful to hear from some of the children themselves. Uh, we know that mental health disorders are prevalent in the United States. This data from the Journal of Pediatrics shows that 7.4% of children aged 3 to 17 have a behavioral disorder or conduct disorder, which represents 4.5 million. 7.1% um, have been diagnosed with anxiety, representing 4.4 million. And 3.2% have depression, representing 1.9 million children. This data is actually from 2018, and as we know that uh, mental health disorders have increased during the pandemic, as the numbers have likely increased since then. Dr. Ahmed, can you share with us some data on mental health disorders in the COVID era? Um, yes, I definitely can. Um, so in a recent data analysis of private health, health insurance claims, Fair Health actually reported that mental health claims in teens overall doubled self-harm increased by 90%, um, self-harm claims, I mean, and overdose claims increased by 95%. Generalized anxiety disorder claims increased by 94% um, when comparing the same months in 2019 um, to 2020 during COVID. Um, and our, we can go to our next slide. Um, and 
this data, data reflects kind of a similar increase in our ED. And so um, ED visits for mental health, um, and this is um, kind of on a more national level um, for mental health increased by 34% in children age five to 11 and 31% um, in children age 12 to 17. We've seen a similar increase in our own ED. I work in consulting in our uh, pediatric ER and as well as our medical floor. And we've seen an increase in utilization and kids presenting to the ER as well as the floor um, for mental health concerns. And so it's, it's really um, affected our hospital as well. Thank you. And I know one of the questions we had gotten as a pre-submitted question was how this was affecting different age groups. And we can certainly see that um, stresses from the pandemic are affecting a, w a wide um, range of different age groups and, and children and adolescents. Um, so here we're looking at some data from Tufts Children's Hospital where we've really seen a similar story to the national data. Our patient days for patients with mental health concerns um, and presenting for admission in mental health crisis have increased more than 50% from prior years. This reflects both an increase in the number of patients and in the length of stay. Uh, Melissa, does this ref reflect your experience on the inpatient unit, and can you speak to our role as a pediatric medical inpatient unit for these children? Yes, absolutely. We are seeing an increased volume of patients admitted with mental health, with a mental health crisis. The unit I work on, Floating 7, is a pediatric medical surgical unit. We are comprised of 25 beds. We typically see patients admitted with diagnoses such as respiratory distress or asthma, or infections requiring antibiotics, as well as those requiring surgery or having their appendix or tonsils out. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, we typically had an average of one to two patients at most admitted with a mental health crisis at any given time. Today, we are seeing upwards of eight, nine, even 10 patients admitted to our floor. Not only has our number of patients increased, but the length of stay has also dramatically increased. Great, thank you. And so we, we are not an inpatient psychiatric unit, but rather care for these patients while they're awaiting their definitive treatment at, at an inpatient psychiatric institution. And so this data reflects the time waiting for an inpatient psychiatric bed in the COVID era. So we have children on our medical unit um, that are waiting on average about a week, 6.5 days for placement, um, but a maximum of 41 days. So we have a number of children that have a significantly longer length of stay um, while they're waiting for their definitive treatment. Um, so we'll now hear uh, the perspectives of one of our social workers, Faith Perez. I'm Faith Perez. I'm the inpatient pediatric social worker here at Tufts. Just like many of the other units across the state is seeing the mental health crisis and kind of the secondary crisis to COVID. Part of that is lack of services at school, lack of socialization, and overall not learning enough online and missing that piece. Some of the barriers to just finding these beds is that some kids have behaviors that are more acute than these, these facilities feel like they're equipped to handle. So these are the kids that are waiting longer. And I think the absence of beds is really the biggest issue and that all of these units are inundated and they go days, sometimes weeks without any discharges because our kids are facing such a crisis right now. If there's not enough beds in our state, there's not enough beds in other states. Boston Emergency Services team, which is the best team, they help us out a lot with our mass health patients, but it does feel like they're running short too. Um, so it doesn't feel like there's enough beds anywhere. So then we have these kids sitting here for weeks at a time, not getting the services that they really need. Our goal is to kind of advocate at a bigger level to say that the need is there. There's such a lack of outpatient services that it's bringing kids in more because they're on four month waiting lists to see a therapist and there's no one that they can get in with and there's no bridge for them. There's a need for more inpatient psychiatric facilities, but also a great need for outpatient um, therapy and outpatient psychiatry because we're, we're really failing these kids on both ends of the stick. Tufts Children's Hospital is an advocate for children, teenagers, and their families, and we really want to give our patients a voice. 
Our government liaison is advocating for more services for these patients and our associate chief nursing officer for the Children's Hospital is very involved in meeting with the Department of Mental Health to advocate for, for resources for mental health. We're also a part of a larger national organization, the Children's Hospital Association, which also has a lot of advocacy for this patient population. Uh, Mary Margaret, can you share with us what patients and their families should expect for a mental health crisis admission? Thank you, Dr. Dadless. Absolutely. When a child or adolescent pre presents to Tufts Children's Hospital in an acute mental health crisis, the emergency department is their first point of contact. Our emergency department uses the following screening tool known as the Ask Suicide Screening Tool or ASQ depicted in this slide. If a child answers yes to any of the questions, they are immediately placed in a one-to-one -one observation, meaning that a designated clinical care technician or CCT will be assigned to the patient and will stay by their side 24 seven in order to keep them safe and prevent them from harming themselves. We immediately remove all electronics and all harmful objects and store them in a safe, secure place during their time in the hospital. Our psychiatry and medicine team will evaluate the patient and if deemed appropriate, an inpatient mental health bed search will begin. Our emergency department here at Tufts will monitor these patients for up to 12 hours. After these 12 hours, they are moved to the appropriate inpatient pediatric medical floor within the hospital based on the level of care required. Once on our inpatient medical floor, an individualized safety plan is created for each child or adolescent. At the start of every shift, an environmental checklist is filled out to ensure the room remains safe for the patient. This checklist is constantly reassessed throughout the shift to ensure that the patient remains in a safe environment. We as clinicians had to shift our mindset not only to keep these children and adolescents safe, but also integrate new therapies and interventions in order to help them cope with the increased length of stay that we are seeing in this patient population. Great. Um, so we, we recognize that one of the most important aspects of care for our teenagers with mental health disorders is team collaboration. Um, Melissa, can you speak to how the multidisciplinary team came together to create plans for our patients with mental health concerns? Yes. So as the number of our patients increase it, increased um, with, mental health, with a mental health crisis, um, we realized that with the increased length of stay on our inpatient pediatric unit, we were not equipped to deal with this and we needed to make a shift in our practice. We went from the mindset of simply keeping our patients safe while they were admitted to our hospital to that of a therapeutic environment. With safety still remaining a top priority, we implemented many changes, including additional resources from both within Tufts Children's Hospital and Tufts Medical Center and out. One of the first steps we took was implementing a multidisciplinary mental health huddle, which meets every weekday morning at 9 a.m. Staff included in these rounds are the nursing team, physicians, psychiatry team, social work, child life, music therapy, our professional development director, and one of our hospital chaplains. Even Bob the dog, someone you're going to learn a lot about shortly, makes an occasional appearance. We all come together to talk about each child admitted with mental health concerns on an individual basis. We review, how did the last 24 hours go? Any overnight events or concerns? Was the child able to stay regulated with their behaviors? Were they calm, cooperative, engaging, following rules and expectations? If they were not able to do so, why? And what can we do as a team to change this? We have all of our key stakeholders right here at the table to discuss this during our mental health rounds, which is what allows us to make any immediate changes necessary. We also talk about the patient's relationship, relationships with nursing, child life, and how the child's family is coping. And lastly, how we can integrate schoolwork into their stay. Since kids are often with us for weeks at a time, this is so important as we do not want them to fall any further behind in their academics. With all of the above, we are then able to build individualized daily care plans and schedules for these kids. They will have multiple points of contact throughout their day as well. Our psychiatry team rounds daily, nursing is available at the bedside 24 seven, and the physician team is always available. Child life therapy, music therapy, occupational therapy, social work, the hospital chaplain, and our facility service dog program are also incredible resources available to us. Thank you, Melissa. 
Uh, Melissa mentioned that some of these children with longer stays do engage in schoolwork. Um, Allie, I know that we have a lot of educators that have joined the webinar. How can teachers and school systems support children and teenagers while they're admitted to the hospital for mental health crises so that they don't fall behind? Yeah, this is um, something that took us a little bit of time to figure out, especially in a pandemic world where school was now online and accessible anywhere. Um, the best way to help our kids is once they're in a place um, to be able to focus on their schoolwork, um, we ask schools and teachers to email um, hard copies of the work to either the patient's family um, or to either myself or anyone else in the psychosocial team um, so that we can print them out. Um, we limit the amount of technology that kids um, here in the hospital for mental health crisis have. Um, the internet has a lot on it and it can often be a trigger. So we try to avoid that. So paper and pencil is the best way to go and giving them worksheets and little excerpts on how to do it if they haven't been taught it is a really, really helpful thing and also gives kids something to, to do during their time here. Great, thank you. So really kind of going back to basics, we're all getting more used to a Zoom environment, but it sounds like that's not necessarily the best option for these children while they're here in the hospital. Um, thanks so much. So we, we will now hear from one of our clinical care technicians, Michelle Gaudreau. Uh, Melissa, before we go to the video, can you explain the role of clinical care technicians in caring for our teenagers with mental health concerns? Yeah, so our CCT role, our clinical care technician, um, their primary role is collaborating with the nurses to meet the needs of their patients. They perform activities such as ambulating our patients, they obtain vital signs. Um, but today they're primarily being used as one-to-one -one constant observers. So with one-to-one -one constant observation, our CCTs are in the rooms of children admitted with a mental health crisis 24 seven. With the child safety being their number one priority, their eyes are directly on these kids at all times and they are always at an arm's length. Because of this close, consistent, direct observation, they are often able to develop important connections with these kids and they're an invaluable resource. My name is Michelle Gaudreau. I have been a CCT at Tufts since January 2020. And now with my main role as a sitter, I'm in the room 24 seven with the patient to make sure they're safe. We really do adapt and we try and do things that are safe and we do set boundaries. It's all about being flexible and um, definitely working together with the nursing staff and the medical team to communicate what I'm witnessing. Really just, we do whatever we can to keep them safe and happy. And Melissa, you had shared with me a particular impactful story of an interaction between a CCT and a patient. Do you mind sharing that with the group? Yeah, so I've worked alongside Michelle for over a year now. Um, she's one, she is one of our many CCTs and other staff members that always go the extra mile to ensure a therapeutic environment for our patients. Um, one thing I see in almost every room are inspirational quotes printed out by our CCTs and other staff and they're hung up on the walls. There are quotes such as, even the smallest of actions are steps in the right direction. You matter, your story matters, your hopes, dreams, and fears matter. All that you are matters and always believe that you can. All of these quotes, plus the artwork, paintings, pictures of family and friends can be seen covering the walls of these rooms, turning the four bare walls of a hospital room into a room of positivity, hope, and inspiration. One story I have in particular is when one of our CCTs was sitting in a room with a teenage girl who was admitted with a suicide attempt. She was waiting for an inpatient mental health bed for weeks with us. When she first came to us, she was completely shut down. She did not wanna to talk to our staff or engage in activities. Over time, our CCTs sitting with her during that one-to-one -one constant observation were able to form a trusting relationship with her. One um, discovered that she loved music. So I remember walking down the hall one day, just walking by her room, and I just saw the CCT in her singing and dancing in the room. Um, and while this wasn't the end all answer or cure that we as healthcare providers wish we could provide, it is something that got her out of bed that day with a big smile on her face. And for that moment in time, she was just able to be a kid. Thank you. I, I really love that story. I know a lot of our um, children and adolescents are really carrying a lot of anxiety and burden with the pandemic and um, to be able to have an opportunity to just be a kid and relax is, is really important to their growth as well. 
Um, so with, with our longer lengths of stays for our patients with mental health crises while they wait in patient psychiatric beds, we've seen the need for additional programming for these patients. Um, Allie, can you share a little bit about what a certified child life specialist is? What types of activities do you engage in with the children and the teenagers? Yes, absolutely. So the role of a child life specialist is to help to produce anxiety and trauma during hospitalization. We do this through play, a universal language of children. Through play, we can help children understand the stress they're going through, the medical terms and procedures they are having in developmentally appropriate terms. We provide individualized coping strategies to each child that allows them mastery over their hospitalization. Along with normalizing the hospital environment, we also include socialization, which is such a vital part to a child's life. Here at Tufts Children's Hospital, there are 14 child life specialists throughout the hospital. We all work as a team to provide a supported transfer of family-centered care from each department of patient visits during their stay, advocating for the needs of the patient and the family. I'm the medical surgical and pediatric intensive care unit child life specialist. And in my seven and a half years working here at Tufts, we've always supported a demographic of patients that were admitted for mental health crisis. However, the number of patients admitted at any time, much like my colleagues have mentioned, has dramatically increased since the start of COVID-19. The priorities of supporting these patients has always been safety first. They're admitted on an acute medical floor as they are not safe enough to return home, but have not yet received a placement at an inpatient psychiatric hospital. Myself, along with the interdisciplinary team, created a safety list of things that could be brought into the patient's room to create that normalization and entertainment during their stay here. This safe items list was crucial in preventing anything entering the room that may be used by a patient harming oneself or staff during their stay. This safe items list include things like a wireless radio, decks of cards, puzzles, books, crayons for coloring, and notebooks for journaling. Previous to the pandemic, these patients' stays were a few days to a week, rarely much more than that, until they were placed and transferred to a facility that could help them with what they need. That length of stay is no longer the case. As the demand of psychiatric beds has increased, our patients are now waiting in this in-between hospital for weeks to months on end. A few puzzles and a book are no longer cutting it. Like I mentioned before, we do try to avoid technology because of the internet access. Even in video games, it's so easily accessible. This is an issue due to the accessibility of them getting on social media and communicating with the outside world, which for many in crisis can be triggers to escalation, which of course we want to avoid while they're here in the hospital. My biggest challenge was the number of these patients on any given day is now averaging between five to as many as nine patients. These are patients admitted because of crisis. They're in their lowest lows and need help and support to work through the struggles they're facing. The team tried to implement a structured schedule, which we know we can reduce, which we know can reduce anxiety, create motivation and organize a child's time. The challenge about time in a hospital is that it feels infinite. The challenge, or in these schedules, we found only we really had activities of daily living, living to include. That's like waking up, eating breakfast, and taking a shower. That's not many things when we're talking infinite kind of time here. Another challenge we faced during the pandemic is patients not being able to leave their rooms. This included things like not even being able to go for a walk on the unit to stretch their legs. We all went into healthcare to help those in need. And this, this felt like the exact opposite. We felt helpless in helping them. There was an emergent need for a shift in how these hospitalizations go. I needed help. I needed more of me to support these high numbers of patients each and every day. This is where the evolution of our program started to kick into gear. Nina, you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, so we're really fortunate that we have such a wonderful child life department at Tufts. Um, can you introduce us to one of our newest employees at Tufts Children's Hospital? Of course. We call him everyone's favorite coworker. As you can see on this slide, 
He's Bob the dog. <laughs> Bob is a facility service dog who was granted to us by the Duncan Joy and Childhood Foundation. This was a grant we received pre-COVID and Bob was set to start working here at Tufts Children's Hospital in March of 2020. A now infamous month for a very different reason, all work travel had been suspended, so Bob remained in Georgia at Canine Assistance where he trained until the suspension would be lifted. It wasn't until August 2020 where we were given approval to travel down to Georgia to do the week-long training as handlers to take Bob back to Boston. Our leadership understood the support, comfort, and light Bob could provide to children, families, and our staff. Once Bob started working here at Tufts, he was able to provide such a calming presence that we humans haven't quite perfected yet. With his service dog training, he was able to enter high stress situations and help patients de-escalate in a calming, safe, non-judgmental, and supported manner. Whether it's him walking over to a patient and lying down in their lap, providing the pressure of his body that allowed the patients to then regulate their own, or with his fur, soft as velvet, which patients can pet to ground themselves in the space they're in. Or simply Bob being Bob, walking in with his favorite plushy toy in his mouth to show each patient he meets. He also loves to do his very own puzzles that patients can actually interact with him solving, which help them focus on something else other than the intrusive thoughts that were overpowering them a few minutes before. Bob has been an incredible asset to to our patients in mental health crisis. And we continue to evolve his work with this pa patient population. We're now utilizing Bob for group therapy for patients who are deemed appropriate by the team to spend time together, promoting socialization that we were prior lacking in this setting. As COVID-19 restrictions have lessened, patients are now able to leave their rooms to spend some time with Bob in either a separate room on the unit or in the inpatient playroom which has been closed since the start of the pandemic. This is something we've just recently started, but have already seen the positive benefits from. Thank you. And I just um, want to take one of the questions that had popped in and are currently that I think this might be a good opportunity to address, which was that um, we also have others on, um, joining the webinar who are um, nurses in other units and are feeling overwhelmed by interacting with this patient population. Um, I just wanted to highlight that Bob has been really therapeutic for I think all of our staff as well um, and a really great support. Uh, there was a question about what um, professional development we're doing for our staff members to help support during this time. Um, and I wanted to highlight that we brought together a multidisciplinary group that's really our mental health committee that's been working on this programming, but also having opportunities to think about how we support and train staff. Um, we've had some sessions um, from Nikki, who you'll meet soon, who, who's talked about things like um, transference and countertransference, um, how we can um, work with our patients to work on um, different coping skills. Uh, we've had some training on um, how to de-escalate patients. And then we've also just had some support groups, opportunities with um, our hospital chaplain facilitating to really talk about, um, you know, how we feel with these patients. You know, it's, it's sad caring for children um, and uh, teenagers that are suicidal and having an opportunity to talk through that, I think has been really important for our group. Um, and uh, others may want to, to add to that later, but just did want to highlight that. Um, so Ali, uh, we had another new addition to our team. Um, would you be able to talk a little bit about the music therapy program? Yeah. So this is another program that we created prior to the pandemic, which was a full-time music therapy program. Here at Tufts, we have had music therapy in the past through outside organizations, but we've never had our own employee. Through Berkeley College and a few other philanthropic resources, we were able to secure a full-time music therapy position. Due to the pandemic, the hospital, there was a hospital-wide hiring freeze, so this position was put on hold. However, due to the staggering number of increased mental health admissions, the Child Life Department strongly advocated for this incredibly valuable position to be approved now rather than later. Leadership heard this cry for help and was able to expedite this position into reality. Channing Shippen is now our full-time music therapist who is an integral part of our evolution in weathering this mental health crisis. The following is a personal reflection from Channing.
Hello, my name is Channing Shippen, and I am the music therapist for Tufts Children's Hospital and Tufts Medical Center. I have the honor of working with these children in some of the darkest moments of their lives, where they are facing their traumas head on. They're placed with us while they wait, sometimes 30 or more days. There's so much uncertainty they are facing during this time. Where are they going next? What will happen after they leave? How many days will they be away from what is familiar to them? I know that my time with them, while it may be a number of weeks, is still temporary. As a music therapist, I am able to create connections with these patients through a resource many of them already use in their personal lives for emotional regulation and validation, music. We work together using a variety of interventions like songwriting for processing emotional concepts or difficult relationships, therapeutic instrument lessons like learning to be proud of yourself for developing a new skill like playing guitar or ukulele, learning autonomy and decision-making through DJing, learning self-advocacy and confidence through developing their singing voice, and so much more. This isn't about permanent solutions though, as much as it is about transitional care. I am providing them with an introduction to concepts that they can use outside of the hospital, in their new placements or at home, to continue building coping skills that can also bring them joy. It is also a matter of offering support for my coworkers, the nursing staff. I try and integrate them into sessions when it is appropriate so that they can make connections with these patients outside of medically necessary moments, facilitating opportunities to build trust and rapport between staff and patients. While I know I cannot take away their trauma, I hope that I can continue to provide a moment of calm and continuity in an otherwise uncertain time. Thanks. So, um, Nikki, you've been working on the adult psychiatry unit and have recently joined our team at the Children's Hospital helping children and teenagers with mental health crises. Can you share what a psychiatric occupational therapist does? What activities and coping strategies do you do with our patients? Yes, of course. Thank you, Nina. So while you may have heard of rehab OTs working in hospitals that help with activities of daily living, just like Ali had mentioned, these are things like bathing, toileting, and dressing. A psychiatric OT works with patients with various mental health conditions or dysregulation that impact their everyday function in work or school, play, leisure, socialization, self-care, and emotional regulation. While my day job is on the adult inpatient psychiatric unit here at Tufts Medical Center, I was recruited by my nurse manager the last six and a half months as a consult service with the suicidal and behaviorally dysregulated patients. Something I wanna emphasize again is that while we don't have an inpatient pediatric psychiatric unit, I've had to learn how to adapt our adult psychiatric treatments and language to fit the needs of the pediatric population um, and working with these nurses who have ne maybe never worked with some of the psychiatric population before until now and just giving them so much credit for everything that they've done and learned and practiced. I meet one-to-one -one with every new patient here who comes in for a psychiatric evaluation and I go over a trauma and crisis tool that was created by various psych OTs to help patients identify their triggers, behavioral warning signs, and coping skills. So as you can see here, it lists all of the different um, triggers that they may feel in the hospital. These are things like loud noises or yelling, feeling hungry, unit rules, maybe not being able to leave their room, many different behavioral indicators, which may include pacing, crying, self interest behavior, clenching their teeth or jaw, striking out. What does it look like when you're having a hard time? And then lastly, calming strategies. These can be used with the interdisciplinary team um, to help the child to be able to cope. So these are things, again, just like Ali had mentioned, um, watching TV, writing in a journal, puzzles, maybe some sensory items such as gum or mints, some herbal tea, a weighted blanket, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and then having the child be able to identify what are the most helpful things for them, making it an individualized plan. While it's difficult to address past trauma histories with some of these kiddos, it's important information that helps our team tailor treatment to each individual patient and helps assess their safety at home or wherever they're living outside of the hospital. So my treatment sessions include offering safe coping strategies, just like we had mentioned. I also offer therapeutic movement through yoga, meditation, and going for walks off of the unit, which we just recently started, um, and out of their rooms where they often spend days to weeks. 
This can include basketball games with Bob the dog outside, playing outside on our patio, um, on the child life area, getting some fresh air, um, and just getting really creative. Um, there was an instance of a kiddo who did have COVID and was stuck in her room for uh, many days to weeks. And so we created um, hopscotch out of scotch tape and duct tape to create some of that movement so she's actually able to move her body while having to stay in her room. Um, I've worked with our nursing managers to get weighted blankets specifically targeted for these patients. Uh, weighted blankets were created by occupational therapists to assist with regulation and coping strategies. Um, they're beneficial for sleep issues, bedwetting, and just overall dysregulation. So we have about four of those in all different um, weights for our kids to use on the unit. Uh, with continued time and support, my goal is to begin offering some more of these therapeutic groups to our patients that help teach things like coping skills, life skills, and stress management techniques, and continuing to work on my professional development, not only as a psychiatric OT, but also to help our nurses and interdisciplinary team to work with some of these kiddos. Great, thank you, Nikki. Um, looking at this crisis tool, these big buckets that you highlighted really look like a great starting point for some uh, of our parents and educators um, that may be joining to start a conversation with children and teenagers. Um, do you think that this could be used in other settings as well? Absolutely, I think this is so important because it puts the control back into the, the child's care, right? They're able to identify what their own triggers are, what it looks like when they're having a hard time and what coping skills they actually like. So this is a great thing to use, not only at home, but in schools and daycares, even summer camps, to help the kids identify what things work for them and what doesn't, um, and put the ball back in their court, give them some control of what they enjoy. Thank you. Um, and that's a great transition because really, Dr. Ahmed, we'd like to think about how um, parents and educators can really be talking to their children about mental health. Um, what advice would you share in, in broaching this conversation and identifying warning signs? Uh, that's a great question, Dr. Nablis. I This is a really trying and stressful time for everybody. And so sometimes even trying some simple interventions is a good place to start. And so what I tell everybody is just invite your child um, and to talk about how they're feeling. Encourage talking, listening, expression. Um, be patient because none of this has a quick answer. Um, often parents also set the tone at home and can be a model for their children as well. Um, so the first rule of being able to take good care of someone else is to take good care of yourself. Um, so practice mindfulness. You can be a model for your children. Um, try coping techniques with your family. And that doesn't have to be anything super complicated. It can be going for a walk together outside if the weather's nice, um, having a meal together, um, if that's something that your family can do. Um, you know, practice some of these mind breathing techniques sometimes together too. If you see that, you know, your child might be escalating, kind of breathing with them through that moment. Um, routine's also really, really, really important. Um, I think that's the root of a lot of the distress that's come from COVID is that it's really changed the way we live our lives day to day. And so, um, you know, as adults in our homes, um, trying to maintain a normal routine as much as possible, it could, it's definitely going to be different than before, but at least having some consistency gives children and adolescents um, an idea of what to expect during the day. Um, and it's something that we mirror even in our inpatient units too. So even in those moments of crisis, and we've seen that improve um, even children in moments of crisis after a suicide attempt or in a moment of really um, large escalation sometimes as well. Um, and that's something that you can also do at school as well as trying to keep that normal routine and maintaining expectations. Something to keep in mind as you're encouraging this expression and um, observing your own children um, or, or the, the children that you might work with is that stress and mental health symptoms are developmentally different, different at every developmental stage. Um, so younger children, infants and toddlers, um, they can be more fussy. Um, they might be having more tantrums, doing things that they might not have done before and it kind of almost regress a bit too. So you might see even your seven-year-old throwing a tantrum or your nine-year-old throwing a tantrum and they might not have done that before. Um, Difficulty sleeping is very, very common. Some children will have problem, a difficulty falling asleep because they're thinking about the next day. Um, they might have nightmares about things that might have stressed them out. I mean, COVID-19 has prevented, uh, presented a lot of scary situations. Um, 
stomach complaints are also really common. So sometimes we we can feel stress in our bodies. And so this could be feeling nauseous. Um, I want to throw up or my stomach hurts. Um, you know, you might go to the bathroom a little bit more too. And so these are all things that you might see in your younger kids and they might not be using their words as much. Older children and adolescents may also feel be more angry. So they might not be throwing the full one tantrums. Sometimes they can be, um, but they might be just very, very short and snappy or irritated and angry. Um, they can have big changes in behavior. Um, they might not be as outgoing. They might be isolating a little bit more, staying in their room, maybe not talking as much. Um, they might also show that they're not interested in things they would normally enjoy. They might quit sports that they might have usually really been really itching to go and do, or they might like stop doing, you know, if it was doing art or playing video games, they might just stop doing that. Um, and so um, that might also happen. People will also just, um, children also display things in school as well. So they'll have difficulties concentrating. This will often reflect um, and uh, uh, their grades might drop. Um, they might have changes in their appearance. So they might not be showering. They might not be caring about their appearance as much. Um, and then some kids might just have outright suicidal thoughts. Um, they might be able to tell you that they're feeling distressed. Um, and in these cases, the more, if you see these pretty severe kind of cases, it's important to encourage the family to um, talk to their pediatrician. Um, they can help screen for mood and anxiety disorders. Um, and then there's also a, a, um, a list of resources that I think we have in our next slide as well. Great. Um, and we have a lot of educators on the webinar. What can teachers, principals, and guidance counselors do to support their students in this mental health crisis? I think a lot of the same things that we talked about doing with our parents. So if you notice a, kid, a child or an adolescent has a change in behavior and notice some of these changes that we've mentioned, um, talk and listen and, and see what they have to say. Um, explore what's going on. They might've had something stressful happen at home. They might've had a relative, a parent, you know, get very sick from COVID, um, maybe even die. And so that's something that should be looked into a little bit more. Um, I think also talking to parents, so inviting that conversation with parents and trying to help facilitate that can be helpful. Um, I know school resources are really, you know, they're hard, especially with COVID and all the changes, it's really hard to get the appropriate resources. So even advocating within your own school system to, to have act more access to social work, um, to counselors, um, you know, to, to maybe have groups with parents would be helpful to advocate within your own school systems as well. The other thing to advocate for and I've talked to a lot of parents about this is that if they are really struggling in school if they need an extra accommodations either through a 504 plan or an individualized education plan so an IEP plan um, that can be really really helpful to help kids get back into school to maintain that routine um, and then again encouraging parents to see their pediatrician um, and then also there are also these um, additional numbers that we can also call and um, go over those as well. Great. And Nikki, did you have anything else to add in terms of how educators can connect with students at school and what accommodations might be helpful? Sure, absolutely. I think during this time, that's so crucial as we're starting to transition either from hybrid or at home back to being in school. Um, it's really important to, just as Dr. Ahmed said, really have conversations with these kids and just understanding that every kid has their own individual needs. So for some kids, they may just need a quick check-in, while others may need to move their body and take a five-minute break. Um, I think having a safe space in each classroom would be really helpful, just as a little area, um, maybe with some sensory fidgets, a weighted blanket, somewhere calm and soothing, where kids can just go if they just need um, a, a quick check-in or a break. Um, also having TheraBands that you can put at the bottom of your chair for kids who maybe are seeking a little bit more of that sensory input and need a little bit more of the fidgety um, movement. There's a lot of information online about how you can create more of like a sensory um, classroom to really adapt for all of these kids who may be experiencing all different types of um, mental health needs. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, can you talk to us about mental resources, mental health resources um, for parents and what they can do if they're having challenges getting into a therapist for their children? Um, the wait lists for out into therapists have been really long. And so the things that I have been talking to my parents about that I've had in con have contact with is if you are worried about the safety of your child, 
um, do some things to make your home safe, then um, number one would be removing any firearms or potential weapons. Um, also securing medication in the locked cabinet. Um, these are things that can dramatically reduce the risk of a child um, completing suicide, and those, those are important things to do. Um, also, there are um, emergency services um, if um, an emergency does happen. Um, there's a, a disaster distress helpline um, that's available nationally, as well as a national suicide prevention lifeline. Um, for a lot of teenagers, sometimes it's hard to talk to parents, and so sometimes I'll give them this crisis line, and so they can text, talk, or any other um, kind of word to the number 741741. This is also like a, a free service that's provided nationally. In the state of Massachusetts, we're lucky to have um, specific mental health crisis teams that can do um, uh, emergency crisis evaluations. So it's not having the family go to an emergency room in the hospital, but the crisis team can come to you. Most of these evaluations have been virtual, um, but this can be a good um, resource if you are, you know, if, if it is, if, if it is an escalating situation. Um, so the number that you can call uh, throughout Massachusetts, it's 1-877-382-1609. And basically um, they'll lead you to get your local uh, mobile crisis intervention team in your area because that can vary um, from region to region in Massachusetts. Any acute life-threatening situation, you really can't go wrong by calling 911 um, and asking uh, for an ambulance to come. Um, you know we went over the kind of protocol that happens at our hospital with these visits. And so that will get um, an immediate evaluation by um, a psychiatrist, mental health professionals, physicians um, in those situations. And so that's something that you should not hesitate um, to call in those life-threatening situations. Um, HealthyChildren.org and CDC also have um, great information and resources for parents and providers on how to make that therapeutic environment, how to talk about stressful situations. And so I'd recommend going to those websites as well. Great, thanks so much. Um, so we'll now move into the Q&A portion and address some of the questions that have been uh, raised by participants before the session and um, live through our Q&A function. Um, so our first question is from a teacher, but I, I saw this theme really reflected through a number of questions from um, different educators and also from parents that students have been out of school, um, many of them for about 18 months. And how can both teachers and parents help students to feel safe inside the school? And what can they do to prepare them for this transition? Um, Allie, would you comment on that? Yeah, um, the, the biggest thing that I think we all have kind of said throughout this is that listening to children and what they're saying and being an open line to them saying, I'm here for you. If you need to talk or tell me what you're feeling, I want to know what you're feeling and letting them know that you've had a hard time this year is important because they're looking to the adults in their lives to be like, this is a big thing I'm, I'm trying to process and I'm going to look to you to see how you're doing it. So you can let them know that sometimes I feel like like this and this is what I do you can you can role model things but just let them know you're here to listen if they want to talk um, other than that we asked kids a lot. We told them to pack their bags and they went home and didn't go back to school. And then the news was terrifying. They were living in this world where they had to stay in their homes. They couldn't see their friends. And what an abstract thing for kids to, to have to process. There's this nearly invisible, right, disease going around, this virus going around and, and they have to wear their mask and all of this. And for so many months, we were telling them, you have to, you know, do this, wash your hands, keep your mask on. And now these, the mask, you know, mandate is being lifted and all these things. And for a lot of kids, it's like, well, what, what happened? Right. And explaining to them that the, the virus that, you know, with the vaccine and we, we stayed home, we stopped the spread that it's good. We still wash our hands, <laughs> um, but that it's, it's getting better and come fall, we're going to go back to school. Um, you know, what we can do is First, let kids enjoy their summer vacation is that let them enjoy a break, have some fun, and then we start talking about school. Um, let them know that school is going to come up. Um, maybe schools can have, you know, a tour for not just the kindergartners and the first graders who may have never stepped in the building yet, but for all ages to be able to go in and reduce that anxiety, you know, for a lot of kids being able to see something before the day it happens lets them know, okay, this is the door I'm gonna walk through and these are the halls I'm gonna be in can be really helpful. Um, teachers who have been through so much this year in the past year, writing a letter to your 
children, introducing yourself and saying how much you can't wait to be in the classroom with them again and how fun the school year is going to be, letting them know they're going to be back with their peers and their friends and gym time at school and you know that music and all of those things are going to be things for them to look forward to but as nikki explained having a safe space in the classroom because kids are going to struggle struggle this isn't just elementary school kids too this is going to be all the way up through high school there's a lot of social anxiety now based on being back in big crowds of people even. So being back in the building, have a place in the classroom that kids can just walk to, take their moment to reset and know it's a space that's not gonna have like a stigma to it. Like, oh, they're in the corner. Like it's a safe space you can go at any time. I'm here for you, have those fidget things and then kids can go back to their desk. We just, as adults, have to know that this is a tough transition for kids, and that's okay. But we're, we're not thinking that it won't be, and just stay with them, that we know that we're there to support them. Great. Thank you. Um, Nikki, we have a question from a parent, a 10-year-old that has gone back to um, in-person school and now is having difficulty sleeping at night. Um, are there any modifications to the bedtime routine or different coping strategies that you think a child like that could use? I'm sure that this is affecting many children that are heading back to the in-person environment. Absolutely, and adults too. Um, and I think sleep has been a really big issue because a, a lot of it is um, if they're doing work in school from their bed, um, that could be a, a big part. So wanting to train your brain to kind of reset. And so not really doing any schoolwork in bed, going back to you know sitting at the table or sitting at a desk or wherever it is in the house or library that they're doing the schoolwork and really making sure that the bed is a boundary for just sleeping. Um, another great thing is that you know over the last year, while technology has been great in a lot of ways, um, really reducing some of that technology time before bed is really important. Um, so if they are using their iPad and things like that for school, really allowing them some time and space away from the electronics before they go to sleep. Um, and just creating a fun uh, bedtime routine. I would say um, getting some exercise during the day, making sure we're not taking a bunch of naps during the day um, is super important as well. Um, and I am a big firm believer, as I had talked about in the weighted blanket, um, a weighted blanket you can purchase now even at CVS, Walmart, Amazon, um, and it's a really great way to help with sleep and regulation and sending signals to the brain to really start to calm down. Um, they say that a weighted blanket should be about 10% of your body weight. Um, and yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Um, there's a question about the importance of the diversity of mental health providers in terms of addressing cultural needs of kids of color. Um, and this um, participant that asked the question also specifically um, calls out Asian providers as mental health is such a taboo topic in Asian communities. Um, we certainly recognize the need for representation um, in our providers. Um, Tufts recently hired a new uh, vice president of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, in all of our recruiting for employees across the hospital, we're um, working to try to create a more diverse um, representation to better serve our patients. Um, we're also situated um, actually in Chinatown, for those of you who don't know where we're located. And so um, we try to, um, particularly for the, for the Asian community, have a lot of um, connections with our local community organizations to make sure that we are serving that population. Um, I know, um, Dr. Ahmed, there's been some integration of the, um, the mental health services with our pediatric Asian clinic. Um, could you speak to that as well? Yeah, recently um, we actually are working with our child outpatient um, psychiatric provider, so that's me actually, and so I spend a half a day um, in the pediatric clinic actually working closely with our um, uh, Chinese American clinic as well as our, um, you know, our regular clinic kind of working with um, pediatricians to increase access to mental health in a way that's um, a little bit easier to access and so, you know, people can show up to their appointments. Um, you know, like they would for their pediatrician, but then see me instead for um, mental health questions. Primarily right now we're offering this to um, 
families that have um, the, the ACO Fallon uh, insurance, but that's something that um, I think has increased access, especially in our communities of color. Um, so I'm seeing that we're just about um, at one o'clock. So we're going to wrap up. Um, we thank everyone for attending our webinar and a special thank you to the Boston Globe for allowing us to highlight this important issue um, for children and teens in crisis across the country and particularly in our state. Um, we will be emailing out a recording of um, the, this presentation of the webinar in total, but we can also send the slides and some additional resources. I believe people asked for um, kind of a, a version of some of the crisis tools that we shared, and we can certainly share those. Um, so the, thank you from all of our providers, and we wanted to send the message that really um, not, no one is alone in this. We're all going through this struggle together. So whether you're a parent, an educator, um, a, a medical provider. Um, we're all doing our best and we're working through these new challenges and um, we can all really serve as a support to each other. So thanks again, everyone.